what is the meaning of truth? I'm going to take some time uh, to dwell on the idea of truth because these days, unfortunately, even in Christian circles, it's more about what works than what is true. We are becoming uh, more and more of a pragmatic generation. And Christians, with a good intention of winning people to Christ, we are looking more at methods rather than at the content. Now, methods are important. The only problem with methods is that they should never be absolutized because methods have to be constantly reinvented, reworked to suit your audiences. But the content of what we are going to share with them, namely the gospel of Christ, uh, is remains the same. It is true, but I want to introduce, not that it is new, but it is necessary in a seminar on apologetics, a nuanced view of what truth is, uh, the very nature of the gospel. You know, Schaeffer died in uh, 1984. Um, in a one sense, I cut my teeth in apologetics by reading Schaeffer's writings because Schaeffer came only once to India and I was not able to meet him then. But uh, his ministry in the earliest years in Labri in Switzerland was among young people uh, who were part of the hippie movement. They came from Western homes, some of them Christian homes. They came east. Uh, to look for exotic uh, Eastern philosophies. Some of them blew their minds on meditation, on drugs, and they were trundling back to their homes when they ran into the Schaeffers. And many of them found Christ. But what helped me about Schaeffer was the fact that because he was addressing Eastern influences, it fit straight into the situation I was finding myself as an engineer in the Indian government, witnessing to my Hindu colleagues who would tie me up in knots when I tried to oversimplify the gospel. And, um, and th that's where I uh, began my study of apologetics. And I came much later to read about a memorial service for Schaefer held in 1984 when a girl from Cambridge University made this statement. I always knew that Christianity was true, but it is only after I met, came to know Dr. Schaefer that I realized how true it was. It uh, sounds like a tautology. It's, it's like saying a husband is a married man. Uh, seems to be stating a self-evident truth. But he was actually, what she was trying to say is that the truth of Christianity, out there I know it is true, and by engaging with it and using it as you communicate the gospel to people, to recognize that it is true in your heart and life, there is a deeper uh, conviction of the truth of the gospel. Now, I want to look at the two aspects of Christian truth. What is objective and what is subjective? And you know the word subjective, of course, can um, kind of raise red flags in the minds of some people. But I want to defang that and put it across to you as something which is relational, in which you are personally involved. I'll just uh, take some time to briefly mention the objectivity of Christian truth. Even in philosophy classes, they sometimes ask the question, uh, if a tree falls in the forest when no one is around, does it make a noise? Did you hear that one? Yes. Does it? Yes. Yeah. You know, uh, this is important for us uh, Christians of the 21st century because in some uh, areas, it's being taught that faith is what makes a reality out of a non-reality. I mean, Jesus taught many things about faith, and the Bible has many things to say about faith, but it never says that faith is something that you manufacture. Faith is something that is objectively real. Faith is the faculty by which you connect with truth. Because uh, the truth of the Christian faith is uh, not something which you can connect only with your senses. It has something which, um, which needs the whole requirement of faith. It is the relationship between a blind man and a layman trying to look beyond the wall. So the blind man stands below, the layman climbs on his shoulders, he's able to see. So it's a kind of a faith-reason combination uh, is important in our connecting with the truth. But the content of that 
faith, as we have all of us at, uh, in different contexts, have been talking about uh, the content of the Christian faith as a narrative. I want you to take that with you. It is a story. And it is a story which is embedded in his history. What Stuart said this morning, uh, quoting from Lewis, about myth, which became historic fact. And it's very interesting if you analyze uh, Christian history, uh, the mythology of the Bible, say with the mythology of the Greeks or the Indians, you read Indian epics where you see Maharajas floating around in flying carpets and so on, and then they become the motto of the of Air India or something like that. <laughs> you, you do have a kind of a mythology there, but you see the miracles of the Bible, they touch upon a very interesting, purposeful, well-directed uh, action of the supernatural. It's not a pointless, random display of divine power. And as you connect with it, I want to uh, refer you to two verses. One is to uh, the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 15. You know, I started reading my King James Bible. I was born in an Anglican family. I started reading the King James Bible from... I should not tell you my age, should I? I uh, 1949. I don't know how old I was. But you know why I started reading the Bible? Because somebody said that if you read the King James Version, your English would improve. And that was definitely true. I think um, there were, uh, I was thinking there were four contributions to my um, fascination with the English language. One was my grandmother, who was, my, was one of the earliest medical, lady medical doctors in India. She graduated in 1906, that is 102 years ago, and she would sit me on her lap when I was three years old and teach me English in a very, very revolutionary way. She would not say cat, bat, and all that. She would say one word, cat, and I love to say all words which will rhyme with cat. I did not stay with cat. She would say something like stench, and I love to say quench, and drench, and you really, your diction improves at age three. Then you have the King James Version, and then you have the BBC World Service, which entered my life in 1953, when um, they reported a huge railway disaster in India. And then the Time Magazine, 1960s. So, that's my journey. Now, you know something of my story. Now, in King James Version, 1 Corinthians 15 is supposed to be a masterpiece of English literature. So if you have your old King James Bible, please go back to them. I'm going to read just one verse, which we use in Indian audiences, mixed uh, religious groups during Easter meetings when we have a, um, interfaith. It's not exactly interfaith. It's actually open forums where we invite non-Christians to discuss the reality of the resurrection. And we normally quote this verse. Of course, we don't ask them to turn to page number such and such. Verse 15, more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have test about God that he raised Christ from the dead. You know what this statement is? It means that if Jesus did not actually, historically, factually rise from the dead, we are the biggest frauds. Christianity is the biggest fraud perpetrated on the human race. Are we willing to say that? You know, it is very important. Don't ever say, you know, we used to sing an old chorus, which I don't think we sing anymore. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. It's the chorus of a, a, a hymn, actually. Um, there's a problem with, uh, the, towards the end of that chorus, we say, you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Now, if I say that in India, people would say, well, Mahatma Gandhi lives in our heart. People can live in your heart, in spirit. But what we are saying here is that even if no single human being, past, present, or future, came, has come to believe in Jesus Christ, even then, Christ is raised from the dead. Which means it is a fact, it's a historic reality, to which we are witnesses, even if there is no one to recognize that reality. 
I think we need to begin to share this with people. When we talk about the truth of the Christian faith, we are talking about historic Christianity. And this truth has come to us in the words of the Bible. You know, when we were young students, um, Christians, I accepted Christ as an undergraduate, final year engineering student, 1962. And as I told you in the morning, many of our pastors really did not believe in the supernatural. And we had liberal uh, Christians, young people, who would ask us a kind of a naughty kind of a question. Why do you make so much of the Bible? Isn't Jesus greater than the Bible? Have you ever faced that question? No, it's a question like, have you stopped beating your wife? You are in trouble, whether you answer it yes or no. <laughs> Isn't Jesus greater than the Bible? If you said yes, their answer would be, why do you make so much out of this book? Isn't Jesus greater than the Bible? You are bibliolaters, worshippers of a book. You see the point? So we guys, smart fellows we are, we devised a counter question. We devised the question, what do you know about Jesus which is not in the Bible? What do you know about Jesus that is not in the Bible? You know, when you come to this, this is an important point. It's not just an illustration. Because I'm making a link between the book which is the Bible and the person of Christ. It's later that I came, I ran across a statement of John Stott made several decades ago, where he said, the authority of Christ and the authority of scriptures stand or fall together. The authority of Christ and the authority of scriptures stand or fall together. You know, you have this amazing dialectic between the person of Christ and the Bible. You know, Christ endorses the truth of the Bible. He agrees with the inspiration of the Old Testament, promises the inspiration of the New Testament. But it is the New Testament which bears witness to Christ as well. And that is why you need to begin to see this link when we talk about truth, the truth about Christ. Now that leads me to the question that uh, Thomas raised in John 14. If you read John 14, uh, you should be careful. You know, as I grow older, I have quite a few apologies to offer to several of the apostles. One of them will be Thomas, to whom we have ascribed the adjective doubting Thomas. But you know, if you really looked at it, it was Jesus. Anyone lawyer here? If you read John 14, you would have said, stood up before the judge and said, objection. That's a leading question. You know, Jesus led the disciples in that conversation in a very interesting way. He told the disciples, you know the place where I'm going and you know the way. And obviously, if you were there, you would have asked the same question. Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And then Jesus makes this statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I want you to read this a bit differently. We normally use that uh, to support our claim that Jesus is the only way, emphasizing the definite article the, which I do not know whether is the best way to uh, read it. Please remember that Jesus did not speak in Greek. He was probably speaking in Aramaic. And John is writing it in Greek. Now, I'm not an expert in these languages, although I know a fair bit of Greek. But what Jesus was probably telling him you take the way, the truth and the life are two adjectives, not two nouns. Qualifying the way. I am the true or, or real and living way. I am the true and the living way. No one comes to the Father except by me. In other words, Jesus is saying, the place that I am going to is not a destination and the way is not a road. The place is the Father, a person. And the way is me, a person. Just begin to imagine. Now we are now beginning to see how the proposition of scripture is also connected to the person of Jesus Christ. When we are talking about the truth, therefore, we are not talking about something conceptual. We are talking about something which is relational, which is personal. And that is where the subjective dimension of truth comes in. Our oldest granddaughter is now 
six years old, tough girl, F flew all by herself from Singapore to uh, Dhaka last year by Singapore Airlines. She captained a soccer team where boys were playing under her captaincy and she won a medal. Well, that's all history. Now, this girl taught me some theology. That's what I'm coming to. When she was two years old, we were spending Christmas in Bangladesh with them. She would come and play with us, jump on our bed and all that. But when we returned to Singapore, we tried speaking to her over the phone. Now, our daughter tells us that she would smile, but she would not speak. So I told my wife, when she grows up, she would know how to speak. And then the Lord seemed to tell me, yes, you grown-ups, you know only how to speak on the telephone. But this little girl, who probably resembles me more than you guys do, knows only how to speak to people in front of her. You guys only speak to people who are not in front of you. Email, text, iPod, you all connect in this ethereal way with the unreal world and not in a face-to-face -face way with the real world. You know, I want you to recognize that the relational aspect of truth is never in the Bible divorced from the propositional truth. In our eagerness to defend the truth of the Bible, never ever omit the relational. There are several verses, one of which I heard from Stuart in August 1981, I think. So these things stick in my head. Uh, not 81, 91. You joined us, nine, no, not 91, 98, yeah, that's the mix-up. Okay, now turn to John 7, verse 17. Do you know what I'm going to refer to, Stuart? You will when I say it. Uh, John 7, 17, I want you to unpack this. Now, Jesus is challenging the Jews on how to test whether his words are true and from God. And look at how he puts it. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. What Jesus is saying is that for me to truly understand the veracity of my message, you should make an a priori commitment to me. Now this is interesting. I don't know. I was not in Sue in's uh, class, but this decision making and the will of God is an interesting topic. It's always fascinated me. But many, most of the books I read during my younger Christian life almost made it appear that God was hiding his will and we are to seek it. It's a kind of a hide and seek where a divine human partnership is involved. Is that what it is? I have come to believe that there's nothing of the sort. The problem with us not finding the will of God is because we have not committed ourselves to doing that will uh, before it. We are telling God, you show me your will and then I will decide whether to do it or not. You will never find the will of God that way. You know, there is an a priori commitment. And the verse that Stuart brought to our remembrance in that meeting was from John 5. John 5, verses 39 and 40. He's telling the Jews, you diligently study the scriptures. You search the scriptures. It's not an imperative. It's not a commandment. Search the scriptures. It is an indicative statement. You do study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Do you see what it introduces? This, uh, these two verses introduce to you the tragic possibility that you can come to a book and not come to a person. It tells you that you can come to a book and not come to the person of Christ. You see, I want you to notice all apologetics. You see, when I first started on apologetics, it was highly rationalistic for me because I'm, by basic training, uh, an engineer, mathematics, physics, chemistry, my favorite subjects, three of the most hated subjects among Christian young people. You know, when I ask Christian young people what to study, management, finance, blah, 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 nobody goes into pure sciences. 
you know, John Lennox and I are going to now make a whirlwind tour, getting you guys to do some basic pure sciences. Great, wonderful. Gives you great insight into who God is. But the downside of it was that you became very analytical and you were not integrative in your approach to truth. What Jesus does in this verse is to state that you need to integrate the objective reliance on the Bible with your subjective relationship with God. That is what is going to bring you life. That's exactly what Christianity is all about. And you will notice that this statement, I'll mention that, uh, probably I'll come back to this. But I want to say that the reason why, therefore, even discipleship making, your leadership that you, produce, uh, that you provide for young people, what we heard from Sue in yesterday, Making disciples is not transfer of information. It is not finishing a curriculum. It's not reading a book. It is imbibing a character. Go and make disciples will always remain go and make disciples. I remember when uh, we really got into mass media, radio and all that, we had a, an American guy who was um, into radio broadcasting. Those days TV was not it there in India. And he said, transmit. But later, many years later, I began to think, can, will we have to rewrite the Bible and say, transmit and make disciples? Can you ever do that? I think the go and make disciples will still remain the same. Because it's a transference of character, just like our character is being transformed and all of us can look back on to some people who walked with us early in our Christian lives. And what we are today is because of them. Paul writes to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, Be imitators of me, even as I imitate Christ. We normally tend to say, don't look at me, look at Christ. There is no such option. That is because of the very nature of truth. Because if I come to know Christ... Through this relationship, I cannot communicate it to others purely by sound bites. Your character, what you are, has to communicate to you. If you want a real good pastoral study, read some of these references that Paul makes all over the place. He says that in Acts chapter 20, when he takes leave of the Ephesian church, he says to the Thessalonians, when you read 1 Thessalonians 1 and 2, he says this to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, you know you should be convinced in what you have learned because you know from whom you learned it. Not what you have learned, but from whom you learned it. So the person becomes as important to the communication of truth. Paul says to the uh, Thessalonians, you know what kind of people we were in your midst. You know, that's why uh, the media are great. But no electronic media will ever substitute, either in this creation or in the new creation, the reality of what it means to be a human being. In relationship to Christ, we make disciples. So truth, therefore, is both propositional and relational personal. Both objective as well as subjective. Do not separate what God has joined together. You know, this uh, that doesn't apply only to marriage. It applies to a whole lot of reality in which there are two facets. We tend to emphasize one and we lose sight of the other. Now, the second aspect is something like what we heard from Stuart over these two days. You know, there's a whole loud cacophony of noises. A lot of voices coming and impinging on our young people. Unless you knew the truth, you will never be able to distinguish truth from error. There are too many voices. Some of them are extremely seductive. They appear to be true, but they are not. In fact, um, I wrote these lines. You'll get the handouts at the end of the session. But then I heard Stuart mention this. So many of our books today are about how to. Christian books I'm talking about. I even read in a book that the Bible is like a manual to a DVD player. What a horrible devaluation of the Bible. As if you can just do, it's all a how-to stuff. No. It is a story. It's not a manual. No one was ever transformed by a principle. Broken new resolutions, new year resolutions are a great testimony to this fact. How are you transformed? 
it is when the story of Christ becomes part of your story. And it happens through the work of the Spirit. I cannot explain how that happens. But that's what begins to make the change in your life. Let me make a, a few points here. First of all, technology. You know, technology is, again, a methodology. Don't let it ever take the place of theology, the place of God. We tend to absolutize technology and relativize theology. We tend to absolutize methodology, relativize content. I think we need to get out of that. And that kind of a critical thinking is needed unless your truth base is firmly anchored in the scriptures, you will have this problem. And I want to say, all of us, um, young uh, youth pastors, you want to develop, please remember that uh, in our world, whole emphasis on quantity. I'm not against quantity. The Bible speaks a lot about churches, thousands of people getting saved. But what we need to take from the scriptures is the fact that if quantity becomes your ultimate motive, you will first start with a leakage of quality and ultimately your quantity will go as well. But if you build with quality, you will have quality first and quantity will automatically be added. And I think there are many things that I would like to uh, say here. But what is important is to notice that quality comes first. And quality, when it comes to Christian truth, is essentially interpersonal. Today, I think our churches are full of programs. One of the reasons why we cannot get people to attend seminars, everybody is advertising everything. Good things, not bad things. But you know something is happening when there are too many programs. People get sidelined. Programs take precedence. As a Christian leader of young people, what is your level of priority? When you want to disciple people, when you want to build up people, do you spend time with them? Or do you think of a program? You know, that's one of the reasons why we have not said that we, whether we'll have another two-day program like this. Now, if I Ching and I can go back and evaluate and say we had a great time, people are asking, when would you meet next? Let's go and have another one. You know, that's a temptation that you have to constantly fight against. Because that is not the way we build people. How do you come to this conclusion? Because of truth. But not truth in an abstract sense. Truth in a realistic sense. Secondly, information. I mean, we are in the middle of an information deluge. And we mistake information for knowledge and wisdom. Today, I don't have time to process information. One of the first things I do is to delete, particularly delete letters which are to be sent to everyone in your address book. That kind of a message is deep personal. If this was possible, God would have put up the best multimedia presentation possible. Why did he send Jesus into the world? And you know, for us Singaporeans, mission trips are very important, very much part. But Jesus didn't come on a mission trip. She came on mission, full stop, period. He is now permanently human, divine. His humanity has not been laid aside. He's still a human being. You know, the Singapore thing, Singapore is, of course, a very wonderful uh, city. In fact, when we first moved in here, 2001 March, my wife had a stomach flu in Singapore. So I told our Bible uh, study cell group in uh, St. Hilda's, we Indians need a minimum level of pollution to stay healthy. You are too clean for us. <laughs> you know, you go 10 days to Cambodia and come back to the cleanliness, the sterility, the purity of Singapore. Jesus didn't have any such exit route when he came to be with us. I think we need to begin to see that our uh, talking about IT is because, in a sense, it reduces the reality of the gospel to pure information. Whereas gospel is incarnational, it becomes flesh. Uh, was it last year? No, year before last, I was in um, India. I uh, visit India twice a year. I was in one of our engineering college campuses. 
and uh, to, I was going to be speaking at a Christian uh, meeting of uh, students uh, when the leader of this group was a girl came in tears because she had uh, seen on one of the class desks a very uh, enthusiastic Christian student had carved Jesus loves you in a great way of preaching the gospel. Whether it's right to carve on uh, school desks is another question. I'm not going into that. But you know, another student, I don't think he wanted to spite Jesus, but he wanted to play the fool a bit, I think. So he had carved something very blasphemous below that. And this girl saw it naturally, she was upset. So when they came to my, when they came to the meeting, I said, why not we discuss this issue? Now you see, the word, Jesus loves you, remained word. When it was insulted, it could not respond to it. But if the word had become flesh in one of you students, and if someone had hit, hit you on the right cheek, you would have turned the other cheek. In other words, the word become flesh could respond. The word stays word, information. Think, think. Let my people think is one program that I do. Um, it's about truth, but not truth in an abstract sense. It is think, to think through the nature of God's revelation and why our own methodology, our own way of discipling people should follow that. Thirdly, I think one of the big issues today is the multiplicity of choices. I think Stuart mentioned it. There is a false impression making the rounds that the more choices you have, the more freedom you have. I'm sorry, that's not true. The opposite is true. You're actually paralyzed. And finally, you know what you do? You just do what you feel like doing. You shop like you feel like. You know, my famous uh, description of Changi Airport. It is essentially a shopping mall. The fact that planes and land and takeoff is purely incidental. <laughs> that doesn't promote anything. You begin to see that it is more than that. And that is why, thank God, when he reduces the number of choices before you. How to sort out, how to sift the chaff from the wheat. Not easy. Fourthly, affluence. Affluence is a big problem. You know, um, we have prosperity gospel, but you know we South Asian Christians, Indian Christians, we thought the answer to the prosperity gospel is the poverty gospel. The poorer you are, the more spiritual. We got it from all our atheistic, our ascetic religions, both Hinduism and Buddhism in India have produced their own set of ascetics. So we thought, oh, this is affluent, this is prosperity gospel, watch out, let's go for the property, uh, uh, poverty one. That is not the answer. Contentment gospel. You know, Philippians 4, verses 12 and 13, I know how to be abased, I know how to, how to be in plenty, how to suffer want. I can do all things through Christ. You know that I can do all things, one of the most misused words in the Bible. A student doesn't prepare for the exam the next day. He keeps the Bible under his pillow. I can do all things through Christ. No. That's about living in the tension between plenty and want. You know, Stuart uh, once introduced me, and we've been constantly talking about it whenever we met. Think of India, China and India, reaching the living standards, say, of the U.S. Will this planet be able to support us? I wonder. How would you measure the well-being of the human race? Is it growth, growth, growth? Think, you see, the truth of God, His commission, His commandment was the first commandment, Genesis 1.28, includes the Great Commission. I see the Great Commission as part of the first commandment. That you shall look after my world. How will I live in it? Be satisfied with what I have. I do not think any ideology meets the requirement of the Bible. Capitalist ideology? Look at some of the frauds. This guy, Societe General, this guy who just sold billions of dollars. Look at all these executives of Enron and WorldCom, swindle their own shareholders and the public. And look at the co collapse of communism and socialism. We are in an interesting stage of life where in one lifetime we have seen the weaknesses of all possible ideologies. And we have to live 
in this world. And what I feel is a special responsibility is to recognize that as leaders of young people, we have a special calling because young minds are impressionable. What are the impressions they get about the Christian faith in your, under your stewardship? That is something that you have to carefully evaluate before God, like Stuart put it today, with the Bible, think, pray, wrestle with God, consult your peers, work out something. Finally, I want to say something about the development of the mind, something that has been very much upon my heart. You know, three words we use very often, two of which are more popular in Christian circles, revelation, reflection, and devotion. The first and the last, revelation and devotion, are very often emphasized. Revelation from God in scripture, I uh, read the Bible and so on, and then I obey. But I think we leave the th second word which I mentioned, we leave it out, reflection, contemplation, looking into the face of Christ, even as I read the scriptures, as the character of God begins to be stamped on our lives. You begin to see that the spiritual exercises, spiritual disciplines are not just doing certain things. Of course, there are times, like I said this morning, when um, you don't have the mood to do something and you grit your teeth and get uh, to doing it. But what God is doing is something much greater. He's beginning to transform you. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, if you looked at Romans 12, 1 and 2, verse 1, present your bodies is in the active voice. You have to do that. But verse 2 is in the passive voice. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because that transformation is something that you cannot do. But you have to let God the Spirit do it in your mind. You let the Word of God transform you, and that happens not when you look at principles outside of you, but when Christ lives in you through His Spirit. Just a few final thoughts. The place of apologetics, particularly in um, the context of uh, work among students, and many of you work among campus students, uh, is the, the issue of the heart-mind coalition. You know, Josh McDowell, I think, made this statement, the heart cannot delight in what the mind rejects as false. The heart cannot delight in what the mind rejects as false. When you go out of a program like this, you are taking away with you the fact that this is really true. Like this girl said at Schaefer's memorial service, I always knew that Christianity was true, but it's only now that I realize how true it was. I can really begin to delight, my heart begins to delight in what the mind affirms as true. And therefore you notice that alongside the personal, the emotional relationship with God. There is this amazing enjoyment of God's truth, objectively, mentally, and to be able to share that with that conviction. Secondly, the truth of God is never counterintuitive. It is never against your intuition in its right place. Intuition is not the best judge, and intuitions are fallen, so I will not appeal to it as a final um, arbiter. But I'll give you an example. This was in one of our open forums. I was speaking about, this is again a group of people from many different faiths, and um, speaking about uh, how humans are the crown of God's creation, our responsibility, freedom, and so on. Now, in the audience, there was a friend of mine who was a World Wildlife Fund enthusiast. Done a lot of reading, writing as well. And he told me during the Q&A, he said, LT, we know now that animals also have a sense of pain and pleasure. Dogs indicate a sense of guilt when they disobey the master. Why do you say that humans are higher than the rest? You know, those were the days when India had launched the first Project Tiger 
to save the tiger from extinction. We are now into a second project tiger in India. And I told him, you know what, we are into project tiger in India. When I as a human being look at the tiger, I know that he can harm me and still I feel I should protect him. But when the tiger looks at me, his feelings are very different. He looks at me as potential lunch. Why is this difference? Is it not because somehow in the order of creation, I am higher than the tiger? You know why I'm giving you this exa example? Is that we must invent metaphors. We have to think of examples, illustrations, which appeal to the right aspect of human intuition. See, when God made us in his image, he made us instinctively capable of recognizing his truth. It's the fall which has damaged it and then continuous, continuous indoctrination in the wrong direction will damage your intuition further. But when we begin to communicate, this is exactly how Jesus spoke, his parables, his stories, they were all metaphors, which they understood much better than we do at this point of our time and culture. Thirdly, doctrines are not impractical truths. They have to be used for constantly critiquing not only ourselves, but the culture around us. It's a renewed mind which can look through the subtleties of culture. Now, all of us appreciated um, uh, Stuart. I hope some of you would return with your friends on Saturday for the seminar. What does Stuart actually do? He is actually looking with us, taking us on a journey through an analysis of culture. And that doesn't come automatically. It requires an exercise of the mind. And that's the challenge we have to place before young people, to be able to see where the world is at at this point of time. Finally, we challenge the minds of youth for one important reason. I'm going to read those two verses. The rest of it you have in your notes. But turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 4 and 5. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary... They have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You know, Paul speaks about something called a mental stronghold. I want you to read this passage. Think about it when you go home. You, I, I have tended to read it in two ways. One is a simple apologetic. You are demolishing wrong arguments and you are helping people, enabling them, showing them the way, empowering Christian young people to bring their thoughts, make it obedient to Christ. But when he invokes the divine power of the weapons, namely the Spirit of God and the Word of God, he is also referring to a, some kind of a supernatural stronghold. Something which Satan has built up, it can even happen to us Christians, because when you become a Christian from any background, you bring with you a certain baggage, a certain stronghold, certain way of thinking. And that has to be chipped away at. You need to work on it. Otherwise, it will constantly be guiding your thinking in a particular direction which is not biblical. And Paul is saying that's what we need. We need to begin to reflect on the truth of God, the Word and the Spirit. Some years ago, Stott uh, wrote this book, The Word, the Church and the Spirit. Beautiful. How God... The Holy Spirit takes his word, works it through the community of God's people in achieving a certain change in the mindset of God's people. You know, uh, a person who, a medical doctor who is now in, um, in his 80s, lives outside of Brisbane in Australia. He was um, an outstanding surgeon, but he spent half his life in India and um, in Nepal. He was director of the United Mission to Nepal. Dr. Frank Garlic 
who told us young people once, we have accepted Christ in our hearts and secularism in our heads. What he meant was the mental strongholds, that your set of values is something that you have taken from the outside world. Some of these things I've said, there are overlaps. I hope you begin to see this. But I want to emphasize that the reason why we are talking about challenging the mind of youth for Christ is because these strongholds need to be challenged, broken down, dismantled, so that we begin to think rightly. See, that is the challenge in front of us. And so as we come to the close of this seminar, shall we pray together? Shall we stand up? <clears throat> Father, Son, and Spirit, eternal triune God, we thank you for these two days. Um, there were so many of us speaking in so many, on so many different topics. But we perceive that you have been speaking one message from so many different angles, which only you can do. None of our consultations could have achieved that. We thank you, Lord, for this unity and diversity that is reflecting your own divine being. And Lord, we want you now to send us into the world. You, we want you to protect us, to keep us, to lift up your face upon us to give us peace, give us a deep sense of confidence as well as clarity. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, how in, in such an inimitable way he tells us this continuous story, this grand drama from the present creation to the new creation. And how, Lord, each one of us here in this room have been able to latch on to this grand story at various points of time in our own lives. And Lord, we want to take this story to our constituencies. We thank you for the people whom you have kept under our charge. And we just want to pray that you will give us that deep sense of responsibility as we guard our own lives, we guard our doctrine, and as we communicate the truth to them. And we thank you, because there is no one like you. We worship you, Father, Son, and Spirit, because there is no God like you. There is no one who is so loving, so knowing, and so free and sovereign as you are. So we worship you. And we thank you because this approach on our behalf is possible. Only because one of you became one of us. Even Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.